That was the quietest one I can ever remember. So this is what it's like to keep the feast. <laughs> I'd almost forgotten it's been so long since, uh, well, I guess I get, did get to spend the feast in Panama City Beach last year. But this has been special and it's been fun and thank all of you for coming and making this such a wonderful time. It wouldn't have been the same without you, I'll just say that. I don't know what you're gonna do without Michael. Has my son been terrific or what? <laughs> you're welcome after calling me Mr. Armstrong. I went to a party for, for lunch the other day and there were some United people there, you know, and I, you know, that was nice. I got to meet some new people and one guy came up to me and he introduced himself and I introduced myself and he said, what are you, Herbert's grandson? <laughs> well, as a matter of fact, <laughs> e even Anna liked that. I didn't bring any notes up here. I realized a few minutes ago that I left my glasses in the car, so it wouldn't have done me any good. I wouldn't have been able to see anything. You know, for years I have live, lived, eaten, and slept world events and kept up, and I mean, it's, I mean, everywhere I'd get, I'd check to see what's happened, because I wanted to know. I don't even want to know anymore, because it is just too depressing. And I feel bad about some of the uh, items that I write about in the letter, some of the things that are going on, because I really don't want to think about it. I don't want to watch our country being destroyed. I don't know if I should talk about this. I, I saw a Trump rally night before last, and it was inspiring. I got to tell you, I was inspired. I don't know if our leadership is on our side or not. I get the feeling that they're on the side of everybody but us. When I see what's going on on the border, I don't know whether to get mad or sick or what. It's horribly depressing. And I'm not watching world news the last thing before I go to bed because I don't want to have nightmares. Having nightmares while we're awake. And it's a little tricky knowing how to address this stuff and not get kicked off Facebook and Twitter, and I don't like those guys. You know, we were spending a fair amount of money with them, and I realized that that's the most effective, cost-effective way of getting a message in front of a lot of people. But Zuckerberg makes me mad, and I don't want to put any more power in his back pocket. And Twitter, oh, I mean, that, that idiot. You know, this has to be by government agreement. This has to be government agreement with these little goofballs, okay? Uh, Dorsey doesn't look like he's been sober in months. Or, you know, had a shower for that matter. I don't know, you know? But these guys are running our universe? I don't think so. We're not going to play along and we're, uh, you know, we're going to have to have a board meeting to find out what we do and how we do it and avoid putting any more power in the, uh, with, with these idiots. Sorry. Are, are we streaming, Michael? Oh, well. <clears throat> I don't want to get us kicked off today. I, I could do it. I could just do it in the next five minutes and, and I would love every minute. I, I'm just tempted to turn the camera off and let me loose. But you know, I've already been warned and they, you only get one warning and then they kick you off Facebook. You're not allowed to speak. You know, you say something, that, it's a good thing we weren't streaming last night, I'll tell you that. It's all kinds of opinions about the virus and the vaccine and apparently today is the day that some of their authoritarian orders kick in. Today is the day that the nurses get fired from the hospital because they don't want a clot shot, or they don't want the shot. They don't know what's gonna happen with this shot. And I hope it doesn't do any damage because a lot of my family members took it. A lot of my girl cousins and everything, they don't wanna be denied what they wanna do. They're my age. They wanna live a little. They wanna travel. They want to go and do and uh, not be hassled. Well, I know the Bible says there, uh, the, that rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. 
But it looks like that we're going to be called on to rebel, if not now, so at some point in the future. I, I read last night some, uh, I don't know, some unleashed liberal who, who was uh, really calling everybody that doesn't get into line immediately an idiot. And uh, he finished it by saying, go get, go get the vaccine, stupid. Well, I, you know, uh, I, it's getting risky again, isn't it? <laughs> Michael doesn't care. We've already streamed the feast, so if I, if I get us kicked off, uh, no big deal. I guess it is a big deal because we plan to continue to stream the sermons and whatnot out of Tyler, and it's just obscene that these guys have the power to pull our plug you know, over something that is, uh, you know, supposed to be accessible. But if we don't get used to rebelling now, if we do not draw the line somewhere, what are we going to do? I mean, you think they're not going to ridicule us if we don't take the mark of the beast? You think they're not going to call us every name in the book? You think they're not going to hound us to the last farthing? I mean, they're going to, well, I mean, the Bible makes it pretty plain. And I've already drawn the line. That's why I got to spend the feast with all of you. <laughs> hey, it was, I had a better time. Than, well, I had more fun. I, I had as much fun as all of you did. <laughs> I had all kinds of fun. And it's just such a relief not having to race around, race here, race there. Wow. Man, I may never travel again. I mean, except by car. I, I enjoy traveling by car, but I don't enjoy traveling by air. Uh, these, I mean, you put a blue shirt and a badge on somebody and they can do anything to you. And they will if, they, if you give them the opportunity and, you know, <laughs> they see me coming, I guess. Dr. Ricks is chortling to himself. I don't know. They got him too. I think we fared pretty well. They, they've had a, something of a coronavirus outbreak at the feast in Florida. Stan got it. He's already doing better, but I don't know about Judy. I haven't, I haven't called to find out this morning. Last I heard, Stan, Stan was getting it over it rapidly. And I hope everybody else does. I, you know, there may, I've heard 30 people left the feast and then I heard 50, well, so who knows? Who knows what to believe or who knows exactly. But I hope you will remember our brethren in Panama City Beach and Stan and Judy and so many others. I talked to Robert Nunnery down in Myrtle Beach and boy, he was on top of the world. And he had, he had no coronavirus stories to tell me. But apparently we have had some people leave the feast early and people had to go home because, you know, they didn't want to get sick, they wanted to get where they could be treated and where they could rest. My son had it just uh, not long before the feast. And it wasn't that bad. I, he didn't suffer terribly. He was chilling and he had a fever and he just stayed home for, I don't know, three, two, three days for a week. And, uh, you know, I left him alone. I went and got his whatever kind of stuff they wanted from the drugstore and left it on the front porch, rang the doorbell and ran. <laughs> I'd a whole lot rather get the virus than get the shot, you know? I'm gonna survive it. I'm gonna survive the virus based on all the stories I've heard. I, I don't know about people that get pneumonia and have to go on a ventilator and whatnot. If they put you on a ventilator, good luck ever getting out of there. In fact, I'd just soon die at home. I don't want to go to the hospital and get tortured to death like they did my dad. And, and, and if you work in a hospital, if you're a nurse, I'm a heap sorry. But I saw what they did to my dad, and it wasn't any fun. And you don't argue with people at the hospital. I mean, you do not question their integrity. By all means, you just don't do it. Or they get, they get really irritable, and they, and they get even more authority than they had in the first place. They have, some of them are really nice, that's, that's true, but most of them are just doing their job. And you are their job. 
and you got nothing to say about their job because they, they got to do their job. Don't get in their way. Don't argue about it. Don't ask them any questions. Just get out of their way. Mom made the mistake of expressing herself emotionally one time while dad was ill and the doctor called her at 11.30 at night, woke her out of bed to chew her out. You don't question doctor's authority. Well, you know, I, I appreciate their education and I don't mind hearing what they have to say, but I don't have to deal with them. I don't like, I, I don't like them. And I hope I never see that doctor that treated my dad because dad didn't have any business dying when he did. Without their, you know, Grandpa Armstrong, now, you know, we don't want to revert all the way back to the 1960s when Grandpa Armstrong called doctors butchers and medicine monkey pus, <laughs> which he did. I think the church even got in a little uh, legal scrap over it, and I didn't even know how that turned out. I don't think it turned out very good because he talked about somebody in particular, and uh, that was back when, you know, ministers had just huge authority. And, you know, some of them still do. Uh, you know, dad was, my dad was part of that system in the 60s and the, I guess, into the 70s. And, and then he realized that, that that wasn't the way God intended. I mean, we were given free moral agency for a reason. And that's for everybody to be able to decide on their own and not have to be hammered and whipped into submission in order to do what some minister says or so he can enjoy his authority. I don't like that. And dad didn't like it. You people are free because the church isn't demanding one thing of you. We're not demanding that you get vaccinated. We're not demanding that you don't get vaccinated. We hope everybody uses their best judgment. And if you got a healthcare professional that's on your side, you know, make up your own mind. But we're through issuing edicts that, don't, that aren't in the Bible. I mean, God issues edicts and, and it's our responsibility to know what they are and to preach and teach. And then it's up to the individual, is it not? We're not going to punish anybody. We're not going to deny someone membership or, or attendance or anything else. And some of these churches do. Some of these guys are still puffed up in their great authority. And they can just bark orders whenever they get ready. And they expect everybody to hop to. I mean, the idea of little Fauci. Now, I know a lot of famous actors and everything are short. You know, I, I think Tom Cruise is about this tall. But... <laughs> Now Fauci thinks he's Robert De Niro. Oh, I hope he's going to be starring in a prison movie real soon. <laughs> yeah, we got to draw the line somewhere. And uh, I drew the line at the TSA this year. I, I, I was going to fly up here because I figured if I drove, you know, what's going to happen to my car when I fly away? if I go to Tahoe. So I was going to fly to Springfield and then I was going to fly to Tahoe for the last few days of the feast. And I got to thinking about it. I'm going to have to mosey around in these airports with my mask on or else, you know, be descended upon. And Springfield, Springfield Airport, it's not just Springfield, it's all these little regional hubs. Oh my goodness, they take themselves so seriously. Nothing has to make any sense. They're going to do what their orders are. They're, we're just following orders. Some years ago, Mom and I were, um, I think we were leaving a Days of Unleavened Bread service there in, in Paducah, Kentucky. You know, the great metropolis of Paducah. And we'd gone to this airport. They had this woman. She, I think she thought she was Marshall Dillon. Because she stood probably six feet tall. She had on a cowboy hat and she, you know, she put her thumbs in her belt and was walking around the airport making sure everybody wasn't doing something wrong. Well, there were a bunch of girls that were going to a beauty pageant in Florida that were in line at their little TSA counter at the same time we were. They filled up a 50-gallon barrel drum of 
makeup and lotions and hair tonic, and I don't know what all them girls had, but they threw most of it away. Because you can't get on the bottle, you know. I am sick and tired of our own government treating every last one of us like a terrorist. I'm tired of being groped while standing like an airplane. I don't want to do it anymore. After 9-11, oh, you're all potential terrorists. Well, nonsense. But hey, you say anything to the TSA, yeah, everybody better be having a nice day in there, okay? That's the only way you're getting through. Or you may be going into a back room somewhere. Yeah, anyway. I, here I go on the TSA, and I don't want to get carried away, but that has been one of my major problems about traveling from feast sites. I, I might not mind it. You know, air travel used to be such a wonderful and a civilized experience. Used to be you could get there five minutes before the plane departed, and you could still get on. Ask me. I know. <laughs> now you got to be there, and you got to give them time to grope you. You know, and x-ray you naked and uh, have their way with you if they want to. But anyway, don't let me get carried away. Anyway, it's been an absolutely wonderful feast. I can't remember when I enjoyed one any more than this. Thank you all. I know all of you have had to draw the line somewhere and had to rebel against something to be here at all. It's been a wonderful experience and I've enjoyed it more than I can tell you. Thank you very much for making this such a pleasant experience. I've always had to zip in and zip out of here and I didn't know what I was missing, but now I know. And I'm, I don't know what y'all are gonna do without Michael. You know, we need to go, we need to spread this boy around. Do we not? I mean, I, I'm learning a lot at the, at the same time you are because we've not had these opportunities. I want to recognize my daughter-in-law, Melody. Melody lays out the Watch Magazine, and she, she takes a lot of, uh, I don't know, uh, nervousness and trouble and problems out of everybody else's hand because she seems to handle things. And I am very pleased with the final result, and I hope you are too. And not only that, but for her greatest feat of all time, she is going to give birth to a little boy, Armstrong baby, of the lineage of Garner Ted. And that's what I've been wanting so bad. I've been telling him for years I'm not getting any younger. And nobody loves babies and to play with them and uh, uh, surprise them and everything. I love them. I have the great pleasure of my brother's daughter has a little boy named Alexander. Man, when he sees me, he's ready to climb over furniture to get to me because he knows we're going on some kind of adventure. <laughs> and I got to tell you this, it just warms the cockles of my heart, so whatever. Sonia had a, her, her daughter Alice wasn't feeling one good, feeling very good one day on the Sabbath and they stayed home from church and they watched the feed on YouTube. Well, little Alexander is about a year and he's only, you know, he's aspiring to be Tom Cruise, but he's only a little baby. He's, uh, he's 13 or 14 months old. And when I walked out, see, whenever I get him, I go, <laughs> and we take off running and he just giggles and laughs and he thinks that's the greatest thing. So when he saw me on video walk up on stage, he goes, <laughs> <laughs> of course, there was nothing I could do about it. I didn't even know till later, but I'm so glad she told me. Anyway, as far as I know, we hadn't had any coronavirus here. We hadn't had any trouble. We hadn't had any fights. We might have had a few arguments, but you know, they all ended well. And I have had a wonderful Feast of Tabernacles and Good luck with them ever getting me to go somewhere again. And now for the main message, he'll tell us all about the last great day and what it means. Dr. Ricks. Find out we left somebody off. And so uh, I'm just going to thank everybody and all of you. Uh, I mean, in many ways, this feast has been one of the best. From karaoke night 
Wasn't that exciting? To the yeah. raffle. By the way, do you know that um, we set the second highest raffle refund, I believe, in all times for this fee site, and we had 20% less people. Give yourselves a big hand. <laughs> and, uh, and Susie Fry worked with the our new caterers, and I thought the picnic went well. I mean, everything went really well. And I want to thank people who brought, I think we had more gifts for the raffle than ever before, and a lot of them targeted toward young people, because that's really good. A lot of, you know, toys for boys and girls. It was well balanced, and, and I just want to thank all of you for what you did. Um, and we do have, we try, we try to plan it so we don't waste any money, but, but enough. We still have a lot of bottled water and some snacks left and a few other clothing. Take some snacks and bottled water on the road with you or take them back to your local church. Um, anyway, it's going to be great uh, trip back and I really want to thank you. The title of this message is why the last great day is the greatest day of the feast. I was shocked, you know, when you read scriptures, every time you read it, you see something like an onion you never noticed before. Well, several of the translations of John 7, 37 reveal something surprising. Now remember, even though they're out to arrest Christ, he dared, I assume it's a platform, we'll call it a stage in our day. He got up on the stage and started preaching to the thousands of people in the temple on the last great day, John 7, 37. And here's the part of the scripture that surprised me. John 7, 37, the oracle translation. On the last and greatest day of the festival. And several translations put it that way. It depends on where you put the comma. But I think that is the meaning. That's to me, the greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and cried out, if any man thirsts, let him come to me and drink. So why is this the last great day, the greatest day of the feast? Let's just discuss that and what it means for us and, and for the future. Isaiah 55, 5. Surely you shall call a nation you do not know, and nations who do not know you shall run to you. Notice Christ used the expression, any man. But here's the part I want to emphasize, verse 6. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he's near. We have God with us, near us, his spirit available to us. Use it while we have it. You know that expression, use it or lose it? Use it while we have it to grow. Uh, one of the things I think the last great day represents in God's overall plan is closure. You know, at the end, it's going to be closure. That is, people will realize, well, you know, we were wrong and a lot of things we did, and now the, the real truth is available. We can see how bad the, our first life was. Now we're resurrected in the new world, and we'll get to finish out the right way. And those that are defiantly wicked, well, they'll get their closure too. Because, <laughs> you know, there are some crazy people like Hitler and others Mingala, who may actually die thinking they were right. I mean, there's some crazy, they'll get the closure and realize, uh-oh, I wasn't right. That was uh, the definition of wickedness. But the last gray day represents and that final justice. Isn't that a good thing to know that no matter what happens in this world, there will be final justice. People will pay or have to do a lot of repenting for the bad things they've done and final justice will prevail. The last great day represents that judgment period when all will know the truth, the devil will be locked away, and the gift of salvation will be available to, I'm gonna make a guess, maybe 15 billion human beings, or, or some big number like that. We need to, but we need to value being called first because they're gonna need our help, well, in the millennium, and then in the great white throne, it's gonna, we a lot of preparation needed. We're going to be needed. Now I'm going to read John 7:37 again with a little more expanse of the scripture. On the last day, the greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, If anyone, so that includes everyone, will be called on the last great day, 
although he started his salvation in Jerusalem with the people that were guilty of piercing him, but, um, but it will expand to the whole world. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. He spoke this concerning the spirit. So God's spirit in the last great day will be like a gigantic fountain poured out over the whole world. And uh, I remember when my grandmother visited Ambassador College, she was impressed with how friendly people were. She was one of the friendliest places I've ever been. And there were a lot of converted people there. Can you imagine the entire planet full of converted people or people in the process of being converted? And you know, the few bad nicks will, will be under control. Can you imagine how fabulous that's gonna be? God's spirit just poured out over billions of people. Um, in business, they have something called mentoring. I saw this when I was in, in, the, in Sears corporate headquarters. Um, one young man, um, he was, actually I saw this in the Army too, but maybe in business. Some high executive, for various reasons, will choose a young man and say, I'm going to mentor you and put you on the fast track to high positions and give you assignments, and if you handle them reasonably well, that's the excuse to promote you, put you on the fast track. Do you realize God has put us on the fast track to be at the top of his family for all eternity? Probably, I'm not saying that we put limits on what God can and can't do, but probably for all eternity. Think about that. You know, we're one in a million. Well, maybe not that far in numbers, but it's almost one in a million. You look at the world population and, and the people that know the truth, that is a great opportunity. All I can say is, wow, we shouldn't neglect so great an opportunity. Uh, we need to appreciate it, use the Holy Spirit now, um, but it will be a struggle because we live in the age of Satan, the age of God's opponent, um, but we have to learn to dislike human nature, or at least the bad aspects of it, and love God. And here's something that I believe is true, and I believe when you look at God's plan, isn't he really saying the best lessons are learned the hard way? The best lessons are learned the hard way. When things go easy for you and everything is easy, you don't really learn as much. I know it'd be nice to say, I learn from success and everything going well and everybody liking me. Yes, you learn something, but you learn even more when it's a struggle, when it's hard, when you get a disciplinary coach, a disciplinary drill instructor, a disciplinary boss that says, we gotta do it right. You learn more. Disciplinary lab instructor, you get the general idea. Uh, sometimes hard lessons, it takes pressure to succeed. Now I'm gonna read a story that makes a point. Um, this guy was watching a butterfly tried to get out of a cocoon. It had a little slit in it, and the butterfly was struggling to get out of the cocoon. So he said, well, it's in a lab. I'll take this little knife and I'll slice the cocoon open so the butterfly can just pop right out. Well, the butterfly did pop right out, but the butterfly's body was weak and he limped. His wings were like, you know, all withered up, withered up and he couldn't fly because he'd be great for predators, easily grasped. He was weak. Well, what he learned is in nature, the way it's supposed to work, this little slit is supposed to take several hours for the butterfly to come out of the cocoon, and all that squeezing out puts the right uh, biological liquids spread throughout his body and his wings. And when he finally gets out there, boom, he looks like a giant monarch butterfly's wings are out there, he can fly. The struggle is actually good for the animal. Well, I believe that's true of people. Hard work is actually good for you. If you had a dad or granddad that made you work hard, thank him. <laughs> You're gonna say that's not true. But I know that's not what kids wanna hear. But that's really good for you. A struggle makes us stronger. And there's so many, I'm not gonna run through them all, but there's so many scriptures in the New Testament where Peter says, 
you should be thankful for a trial. And he and John, after they were roughed up by the scribes and Pharisees, rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer for the name of Christ. I mean, the Bible is full of that. So if you do face a struggle, pressure from bosses and, and in-laws, and you know they're going to hammer you for being part of this, this is a non-standard religion. What's wrong with you? Get with it. Um, just remember, the devil has deceived the whole world. So if somebody asks you the question, well, how can you be right and everybody else wrong? Because the whole world is deceived by Satan. The Bible actually says that. It's not making the, you all, of course, know that. Um, take the pressure in some respects as a blessing. As a blessing. I remember something that happened to me in the Army. And, and now as I look back at it on retrospect, it was actually a blessing. I won't go into details, but all I'm saying is struggles can be a blessing. I want to give you a story from my youth. I think I was about 12, 11 or 12, and the police car came up in the middle of the night to our house, and uh, my grandfather was well known in the community. So two police officers came up to the door, and we were at the top of the stairs listening. I didn't hear all the details, but I heard enough to know that Osi, who's four years old, it was in a lot of trouble with the police. And they were going to release him to my grandfather on his own recognizance. And he said, no. He said, take him to jail, put him in jail all night and part of the afternoon, and scare the you-know-what out of him. I mean, that's what my grandfather told the police. And they did that. Well, do you, um, Osi actually lived a very successful, he's passed away now, but he lived a very successful life. He, he followed daddy's advice and stopped hanging out with some bad teenagers. But I don't know if that would have happened if Daddy hadn't told the police to scare the you-know-what out of him. Can you see where that hard lesson might have saved his life or made his life more successful than it would have been? Uh, I think Daddy was right in that regard. Um, <clears throat> so the struggle is good for us. And in one contextual sense, when people are resurrected and they think back on their first life, you know, most of the world, most people have lived a horrible life. They were peasants, workers, slaves, servants. I could probably elaborate, but you get the idea. Most people in the history of the world lived a terrible life with oppressive government, stupid religions, all kind of, uh, well, most of the time, really bad medicine. You read the history of the world and all the bad things, like, and they'll realize the world they lived in was in rebellion to God to varying degrees. Some places not as bad as others, but even in the best places. And they'll realize when they reflect over the old life and they compare it to the paradise they're going to witness around them. And they'll realize, I call it the hard lesson, that going counter to God and God's ways do not pay. I mean... Uh, it really doesn't pay. And, and you might argue, well, uh, what do I mean the ways of man don't pay? Let's look at humanism. I think the French Revolution is a perfect example. You know, they got all, they called it the Age of Enlightenment, and they thought they were, I know we're going to laugh at this, but they thought they were all that smart in the 1780s anyway. Um, and uh, they actually were going to, they killed the priest, killed the king. They didn't need God. They, uh, they Actually, they got rid of the seven-day work week to a 10-day work week. None of this worked, by the way. Uh, and then they started fighting among themselves, and the guillotine was slicing off heads. <laughs> Matter of fact, the American ambassador from France, the first year he was here, he bragged about how wonderful the French Revolution was. Then the second year, he begged Washington to give him political asylum because his party was out of favor. He'd go to the guillotine if he went back to France. Of course, they gave him the political asylum. But the point is, it uh, actually the casualty numbers are debatable, but at least 50,000 people were massacred in France. And it ended with a military dictatorship of Napoleon who then killed many hundreds of thousands in more or less needless wars. Now that was the French Revolution, but people know best. Then you get to the Communist Revolution. Oh, the horrors Stalin killed 
it's estimated 22 million of his own people. Then Mao, maybe 40 million. Uh, well, by the way, Hitler killed at least half a million of Germans who were not Jews. Anybody got in his way and, and mistreated uh, the Slavic people. Anyway, you don't want to hear all the horrors and the stuff that Castro's done in Cuba and they, Chavez did in Venezuela. You get the idea. Humanism doesn't work. People do not know how to live apart from God. And they make, when you read the Communist Manifesto and all these great books, it sounds great. It just doesn't work. It, it sounds wonderful. Well, we'll divide up the goodies among, I know I probably said this more than once at the feast, but, but it's good to hear it one more time. People say, well, why doesn't socialism and communism work? Well, two big reasons. One, when you take the profit motive out, production drops. So you can't equally distribute what was never produced. So you end up with shortages. But secondly, the people who run it are human. And um, there was a story about Stalingrad during the siege when they were cut off from a lot of food supply. And the lady who survived it said, well, the guy in charge, my, my son was starving, we were starving, but this kid didn't look quite so bad. They give the food, the people who distribute limited resources are the party members and the elites. Well, the elites play the system. They, they get all the goodies and the little people get a lot less and the ones they don't like get even less. Uh, we could tell you horror stories, but you know, the food police in Russia, but you get the general idea. It doesn't work. You want a bureaucrat deciding how much you get or don't get? No, you don't. You don't want to, ask people who have been on welfare their whole life. They have to go into government bureaucratic offices and hope that the bureaucrat will give them. Anyway, you don't want that kind of life. But that's man's way. Man's way does not work. And people will come back in the next resurrection and they'll tell their stories and they'll reflect over their hard experiences and they'll realize that God was right, man is not right. And what, um, We'll learn what does work and what does not work. God's ways work. The ways of men do not work. They can make them sound good. They just don't work. Because anything that defies the, the laws of human nature, supply and demand, there are some basic laws that you cannot defy. You can play games and you can write great stories, but they, those laws cannot be broken. Like they're spending like, well, <laughs> this. I was going to say like a drunken sailor, but that'd be an apology to a drunken sailor. <laughs> They're spending like crazy. But we won't have an inflation problem. Yes, you will. You can't print all that paper money without, if you don't increase the resources. The laws of economics says you're going to have inflation. No matter what they tell you in the media, you're going to have inflation. Brace yourself for it. I know you probably don't want to hear that. Many of us are on fixed income, but it's coming. They cannot... They can make it sound great. We'll give you this and that. Uh, by the way, also another law of economics, there is no such thing as free. But they're going to give me free daycare and free junior college. Believe me, you're going to pay for that. And you're going to pay for it more than you think. And the government's going to waste a lot of money in the administration of it. You're going to pay even more. Um, you just may not see it. Uh, there are a lot of hidden taxes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> but if we do things the right way for all eternity, and here's why I think it's worth it for God to let people struggle and suffer. Because people ask, well, why does God allow suffering? Well, there may be many reasons, but one is that you learn the lesson the hard way. And for all eternity, all mankind is later in God's family, will know for all eternity God's ways work and the ways that are not God's ways do not work, whether they sound good or not. And that lesson will last us for all eternity. You know, 70 years is supposed to be the average lifespan. Most of us know that goes fast, doesn't it? Really fast. So we all know that um, eternity is a great thing, forever young. Revelation 22:17. <clears throat> and the spirit 
and the bride say, Come. Let him who say, hears say, Come. Let him who thirsts, whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. And that's going to happen in that last great day period, and well, maybe some of it's a general description. Well, we have that opportunity now, and we need to desire to use God's Spirit. And if you're not um, baptized, repent, get baptized, laying on hands to get the Spirit. We need to use that Spirit. We need to desire the Spirit. Desire the things of God. And I know it's easy to say this and hard to do. Desire the things of God more than you desire worldly things. Like, the worldly thing is pride. And I was talking to a guy the other day. I said, well, one problem that happened to at least several men I know in the church who I think screwed up, they wanted to be on television so bad. Isn't that a great human desire? I want to be famous. It all turned to sand. It was a disaster. But... You need to desire the things of God more than the vanity and the ego or even the riches. I'm not against being rich if you're so blessed, but, you know, it may be a blessing to not be rich. <laughs> anyway, think about it. But <clears throat> desire the things of God. God will get the credit for the, the, the um, people that will be saved in the last great judgment period. But they will have to also do repentance and some desire themselves to do the right thing. Of course, we'll be there to encourage them. And that you'll be in a high position then, and you'll, we'll be able to encourage them all. And something else, I think, some of our relatives will be there that have passed away. And they're going to be, in a right way, proud of you. And you're going to see them again, and you'll be able to help, you know, crazy Uncle Bob, bad Bob. You'll help him get himself straightened out. And it'll be wonderful. The last great day, that 100-year period, will be wonderful. Um, people reflect back on how these, the ways of the world we're living in now do not work, and God's ways do work. I'm going to tell you a corny story that kind of makes a point. I call it the commie dem story. And if you don't get it, laugh anyway. <laughs> okay, the commie dem story. Um, a Republican on a wheelchair enters a restaurant and gets a cup of coffee. And he asks the waitress, is that the famous prophet over there across the room? She says, yes, that's the prophet. She says, he says, well, send him a cup of coffee and put it on my bill, because I like what he's doing and saying. Next person comes in the restaurant uh, is a <clears throat> an independent lady. Uh, who's in a libertarian party. She's all hunched over a hunchback, really hunched over badly. And so um, she kind of painfully wobbles into the restaurant and sits down. She asks the waitress, is that the famous prophet that does those miracles and says great things and heals people over in the corner? Yes. I want a cup of tea and send him a cup of tea free. I'll put it on my bill. Then the next comes in a commie dim on crutches. He hobbles in and yells, hey, hey there, honey, how about getting me a Miller Lite? And then he looks around and sees the prophet. He says, is that the prophet, you know, the one that works for, for God, so-called? And the waitress says, yes. And so he yells loudly so everybody in the restaurant can hear. He says, give him a cold beer and put it on my tab. I'm generous. Um, so as the prophet's leaving the restaurant, he walks over to the Republican in, in the wheelchair and touches him and thanks him. The guy jumps up and down. He can walk and he dances and he's praising God. He walks over to the Libertarian, thanks her and touches her. And all of a sudden, her body straightens up, her leg muscles get stronger. She's standing up and she's praising God. And he walks toward the Democrat. The guy jumps six feet backwards and says, stay away from me. Don't touch me. I'm on government disability. <laughs> uh, okay. That may get us kicked off YouTube as well. <laughs> um, but you know people are going to take advantage. <laughs> 
of the welfare system and it will just corrupt people. You know that, don't you? It'll corrupt, and it will, and even the stuff they're doing on the border, it will destroy the poor people and the inner city people and the people in the Spanish ghettos of America even more than it will anybody else. You wait and see. It's going to hurt the people who need help the most, the most. I predict. Same with expanding the welfare state. It's going to be a disaster. I'm not saying they know it's going to be a disaster, but maybe they don't care as long as they get votes. Another, uh, say, lower class voters who depend on welfare. As long as they get power, they don't care. Uh, I mean, this is a terrible story, but I believe it's true. Uh, Stalin, uh, I think it was his second wife, a very attractive woman, and she was an activist and wanted to do the right thing. And they were starving in the Ukraine and some other places. And some of it was planned starvation by Stalin. Crazy stuff that, anyway, just crazy stuff. And she came to Stalin complaining about it. And he told her, shut up, shut up. And, and he actually, in view of many people, burned her with cigarettes. And that night, she committed suicide. You know that's not true. He had the secret police shooter and just called it suicide. In other words, he didn't care that they were starving millions of people if it fit into his plan for more power. And that's a true story. You, you sure you want communism in America? And the, and the bad thing about that kind of government, uh, even when the people who started the Russian Revolution, uh, as they saw their first leader dying, he sent out a letter. He said, don't let Stalin get in control. But the problem is, when you have that kind of government, often the meanest, most evil, most backstabbing persons get in power. If you just think that through for a minute. You got, you know, Lenin's in charge, he's old, he's dying, you got six or seven people in the Politburo, and all looking at each other, well, who's going to inherit the power? And it wasn't the most talented, gifted, it was the most evil guy, the one that Stalin actually wrote a letter about not letting him get in power, he got in power. Those kind of dictatorial governments, don't they almost lend themselves for the most backstabbing, evil person to take over? You sure you want a man running your life? And then we've got coming up in the, in the future the beast of a man who will be probably historically the worst human dictator is yet to come. At least he'll have a few years of power before God takes him down. Um, that's man's government. That will all be over in the last great judgment period, the great white throne. Um, Revelation 20, verse 5. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. So all the people that have died, they're going to come back. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who takes part in the first resurrection. We are blessed. Don't you feel blessed at this feast site? Right? Don't you feel blessed? We are blessed. Rejoicing that we're blessed. We're going to be in the first resurrection. Probably be in places of safety doing much of the stuff that will, drama that will happen in the future. We're blessed. And I know it sounds arrogant, but we're special. But here's the, here's the tricky part that's really tricky. As Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1, 27, he says, brethren, you see your calling. Not many of the high and mighty, because one guy said, did say, not many, but anyway. Not many of the high and mighty. Notice, God did not call the best people, the most righteous, the most successful, the most whatever you want to look at. And you ask yourself, well, why did he choose us? All I can say is, don't worry about it. We're not the best, we're not the greatest. I think God also did that for another reason. He doesn't want anyone arrogant in the top of his family like Satan was. By the way, it's probable that Satan was the number ranked angel among the uh, three top angels. And there are commentaries that say that. And he stabbed God the Father in the back. And that's why God let David experienced that and Christ experienced Judah, I mean Judas, 
Judas. God doesn't want that. So we're not going to be special because we're better than other people. Because that's always obvious. You can see God could have picked a whole lot of people better than me. And, and most people can say that easily. Just you know, look at your family, look around. But he still chose us. Use it. Take advantage of that opportunity. Um, and we're blessed. Um, and salvation is an opportunity, like Paul says, do not neglect so great salvation. Revelation 20, verse 11 and 12. Revelation 20, verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne, and I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. Books were opened. By the way, books, see in Greek, biblios is books, plural in Greek. So the Bible just means books in Greek. So he's saying the Bible. Do you realize the Bible is not open to most people? I mean, they get part of it. But it's like there's a mental block. They can't fully understand it until God flips a switch and opens their mind. And, and you can argue with people the Bible till you're blue in the face. It just drives them further away. But in the world of that last great judgment period, God's going to open the Bible. And by the way, in all fairness, you realize most of the people in the world, um, many of them never heard the name Jesus Christ. Or if they did, it was some foreign religion that we don't like. Um, and most of the world has never really understood the Bible. They've never really had a chance for salvation. There's no way they should be in an ever-burning hell. That's ridiculous. It made God into a sadist. No, they were, it's going to be just and fair. They will get their chance. The Bible will be open. And they'll have a lifetime. There'll be no more children born. We read that in Isaiah 65 the other night. God will put a stop to the numbers increasing. But for the people that are there, and maybe aborted babies will be brought back for the mothers to now raise them. But for the people that are there, they'll have plenty of time to learn, to grow, to repent, to be baptized, and to make it to God's family. And, in, and then the books were open. The book of life was open. Why open the book of life? We're already at that point. We're, our names are already written there. It's so the people in that last judgment period have their names written in the book of life. And I believe the vast majority will get their names written in the book of life and will, will do well. Revelation 20, 15. And anyone not found written in the book of life is cast in the lake of fire. And probably based on Peter and other things, God is going to transform this planet with fire. And if you're not a spirit being, you'll be ashes. That's what Malachi says. You're going to be ashes. I mean, they're not going to suffer forever. Just, you know, they'll be ashes. Um, but here's one of the things we need to strive for. Mark 12.30. Mark 12.30. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. Just like that sign says, with all your mind, with all your strength. That is the first and the greatest commandment. And then, of course, you love our neighbors, too. Um, that's our prime goal, is to learn to love God, God's laws, God's ways, um, so God can trust us for all eternity, because we're going to have power. I have no idea what God's going to do, but it does appear he's going to, you know, if you look at the universe through these, Hubble telescope. Doesn't it look a little bit like chaos? I'm not saying it doesn't follow the laws of physics and math, but it still looks chaotic, like stars scattered and just look. God is going to reorder the universe and it's so big they can't even see the end of it. Who knows what great things we'll be called on to do, but God will know he can trust us for all eternity. Um, there's no more Lucifer going to be allowed in there. That's our prime goal. And the last great day is about a chance for everybody to learn to love God. But we have to learn to love God now. Learn God's ways. Resist human nature. Resist the selfish aspects of human nature. One more corny story. Just one more. This is called the coffin, sales, coffin saleswoman story. Mrs. Doofus, uh, somebody buys a business for her to run funeral parlor so now she's in the coffin industry and she looks across the street business is down and she sees a fashion store across the street they got this big thing two for one sale she's that'll be great we're gonna have put a sign in the funeral parlor 
two for one sale. So a man comes in there and he looks at the coffins and says, boy, these coffins were awfully ex expensive. She says, don't worry about it. We'll give you two for the price of one. He runs out immediately. <laughs> anyway, two coffins is not what you want. <laughs> um, I do have people call us. Don't you want to plan your funeral and your burial in advance? No, I don't want to do it. I suppose you probably should, but I, I, I'm in no hurry to do that kind of thing. You can buy your car. Never mind. Um, remember, a better world awaits us. By the, so if we do pass away, a better world awaits us, and we'll be kings and priests in the world tomorrow because God loves us. That great day is about the last chance for all of us to learn to love God. God wants closure. He'll get it. God wants fairness. The world will get it. All will get a good chance to learn the truth. They'll all learn to love God with all their heart, with all their soul. And by the way, people say, well, I can't really do anything for God. You remember in Matthew 25, Christ said, when you do it for the least of these, you do it for me. So when you serve other people, in an indirect way, you're also serving God. Because God loves the people, and that's one way of serving God. Because he's way in heaven. Uh, Luke 10, 27. And, ans and answering said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. I think God answers our prayers more when we pray for other people. Be, learn to be as selfless as we can. You know, serve others and try not to think about self. Hebrews 8.10. This is my last scripture. I know, I know the kids are glad to hear that. Last scripture. We get to the food. The last scripture. Hebrews 8.10. Hebrews 8.10. For this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind. I will write them on their hearts. In other words, the new covenant, you know, a lot of Protestants, and I understand that they don't know it, they think the new covenant is about getting rid of God's law and only choosing the ones you like, like a cafeteria. No, the new covenant is about actually putting the laws in our minds and in our hearts. That's actually making the law stronger and more deeply rooted. That's, our, that's God's goal, just what you see on that poster over there. And write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people, people that God can trust for all eternity. This is the greatest day of the feast. Why? Because it represents that last great day, the great white throne judgment period. And maybe 15 billion people will learn to be thankful for God. They will learn to love God's ways. They will learn to resist their human nature. But First of all, we, God needs us as part of the process. We need to be thankful to God, and someday we'll be able to see and help all those people. But first we have to learn to get it, the law in us. And we have the biggest struggle, because Satan is still here, and he would love to pull you away with pride, vanity, lust, greed, and all those things that, you know, that human nature is known for. Um, and the devil is good at what he does. You gotta admit that, right? Don't you know? They say, "Don't take your enemy lightly." That's when you lose when you take your opponent lightly. Like our government underestimated the Taliban. Oh well, I can talk about that later. And yeah, they're really smart. Um, <clears throat> those guys are more clever than we give them credit for. And all our passed away loved ones will be there to help them. But we have to do our part now. Um, and all this is represented by the last great day.